Hello, Church at Chapel Hill. Hey, you know me. I am thrilled and excited to be with you today. Uh, in fact, the only thing that would make this moment better is if I was right there uh, in Georgia preaching, but I'm not. I bring you greetings from the great country of Texas. But uh, hey, I'm excited to share the Word of God. This is even better, you know, because I've come to Church at Chapel Hill so many times. I've been waiting for some of y'all to invite me over for dinner. So now here I am, and you're able to watch uh, wherever you're watching this message from. And I really believe uh, that this word is going to encourage you. I cannot wait to get into it. But before I do, uh, I just want to thank God for your pastors, Pastor Dave and Cindy Devine, for your incredible leadership, uh, especially in these challenging times. In times like this, we need great leaders who are faithful, who are consistent, and who just keep doing what they've always done. And uh, I want to celebrate and appreciate uh, you, Pastor Dave and Cindy, for doing that. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to share the word of God. And I want to jump straight into it today. Uh, go to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 14 through 21. The gospel according to Mark chapter number 8. And we'll start at verse number 14. And it says, The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Come on, how many know whenever Jesus asks you a question, that question is never for him. It's always for you. There is something he's trying to get you to see, something he's trying to get you to comprehend or understand. And he furthers the questions by saying, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Uh, Church of Chapel Hill, I want to tag on to this biblical text a title, Don't Forget to Remember. If you're a note taker or maybe you're in the chats, I want you to type, Don't Forget to Remember. I think in seasons of difficulty, uh, in seasons like we're in right now of chaos, it seems to be, and we tend to remember the things that we should forget and we forget the things that we should remember. But today I want to talk to you about don't forget to remember. Come on, let's pray before we jump into this. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, everybody watching said, amen. Don't forget to remember. Ladies and gentlemen, I regret to inform you that the year 2020 still isn't over. <laughs> Come on, is it just me? Or does it feel like this year has been going on for half a century? Oh, come on, I don't think it's an exaggeration or even hyperbole to say this has been the year that has changed the world as we know it. Oh, sure, every year has its challenges. Every year has its problems. Every year has defining moments. But not every year has such a paradigm shift where you are left with more complexity than there is clarity. Uh, there seems to be more questions than there are answers. Some of y'all right now trying to figure out, am I living at work or do I now work for home? You know, am I an entrepreneur or am I a homeschool teacher now? When are these kids going back? There are so many questions. 2020, this year has changed the game, hasn't it? 2020, the irony, the irony, the number that we associate with vision and yet this is the year we're seeing things that nobody saw coming. And if you're like me, uh, earlier this year, I was having some intense intercession, uh, also known as complaining. And uh, I said, God, I'm seeing some things I did not plan for this year. And God whispered something to me that I want to share with you, Church of Chapel Hill family. God said to me, Robert, don't forget to remember you prayed for this year. 
I said, hold up, wait a minute. No, I did not pray for anything I'm seeing right now. He said, oh no, you, you got a little bit of amnesia. Don't forget to remember you prayed for this year. You're the one that said at the beginning of 2020, God, I want you to change some things this year. You're the one that said at the beginning of the year, God, I want to go deeper with you this year. You're the one that said at the beginning of this year, God, whatever it takes for me to have more of you, I want more. I said, God, hold up. I I don't remember saying any of that. Yo, you know it's bad when God reminds you of the first message you preached in 2020 and takes you to your own Instagram page to watch the clip. Can I show you that clip real quick? Watch this. See, this is what God wants from you in 2020. Whatever it takes for me to get more, I will do it. How many you know? I didn't know the more was going to be this. Now, isn't it interesting, the chasm, the space between what we want God to do in our lives and then what it will take for that to actually happen? Come on, many of us say things like, oh, God, I want you to change me, but I don't want to be challenged. Or, or God, I want to trust you more, but don't let my bank account get too low. Or, or God, I want to go deeper with you, but I don't want to be disrupted. I don't want to be disturbed. But can I tell you, Church at Chapel Hill, you serve a God that will disrupt you. Oh, yes, you serve a God that will wreck your routine. He will mess up your calendar. Oh, please believe he did not cause this pandemic, but he sure is using this pandemic and pushing people into their purpose and waking people out of their apathy and complacency. God will disrupt you. God will disturb you. You can put the do not disturb sign on the door if you want, but I'm telling you, Jesus knows how to kick that door all the way down. Jesus will disrupt you and disturb you. That's what he did on earth. Come on, almost every day is like the disciples woke up and looked at Jesus and said, hey, what are we going to do today? He's like the same thing we do every day. We are going to comfort the disturbed and we are going to disturb the comfortable. And that's what he did. He comforted the, comforted the disturbed, but he also disturbed the comfortable, especially his disciples. And that's what's happening in my text today in Mark chapter 8. First of all, before Jesus gets on the boat with his disciples, he's had this encounter with the Pharisees, the religious Gestapo. He's had this encounter with them and he's been moving in the earth, healing the sick, raising the dead, moving in miraculous power. He's walked on water. He has healed people, casted out demons. He just multiplied fish and bread and fed thousands of people. And the Pharisees, who are probably still munching on the fish and bread that he just multiplied, have the nerve and audacity to say to Jesus, well, give us a sign that you are really sent from God. And Jesus is like, are you for real? Have you not been paying attention to what I've been doing? And he says, I refuse to give you or this generation a sign. In other words, Jesus says, I have nothing to prove to you because I know who I am. I want to pause right there and tell somebody, how many of you know there is no freedom like knowing that you have nothing to prove to anybody? He said, I don't have anything to prove. If you've been paying attention, you would know I'm sent from God because you don't have have a lack of evidence, what you have is unbelief. And he leaves the Pharisees, gets on a boat with his disciples, and the disciples realize that they only have one loaf of bread. To which Jesus responds and says, watch out, be careful. And they're like, what, is another storm coming on this boat? <laughs> He's like, no, watch out. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. And you got to imagine being the disciples in this moment because it's only you, Jesus, and a loaf of bread on the boat. And they had to be going, Jesus, what are you talking about? Nobody is on this boat but you and us. What are you talking about? The yeast of Herod and the Pharisees. And I love this because this is classic Jesus. How many of you know conversations with Jesus were often confusing? 
I mean, they had to be. Jesus was fully God and fully man. You understand, Jesus was not just a good man. He was a God man. He was God manifested in the flesh. He was the perfect amalgamation of deity and humanity, 100% God, 100% man. And when you are talking to God in the flesh, Oh, the conversations can sometimes get confusing. Come on, the Bible is replete with examples. You remember one in John chapter two, I believe the first miracle of Jesus. And his mama says, hey, they just ran out of wine at the wedding. They're out of wine. To which Jesus replies to his mama and says, woman, what's that got to do with me? It's not my time. What is Jesus talking about? She said they're out of wine. He said, it's not my time. You know why? He's fully God and he is fully man and the God in him that was going to die on the cross. He understood that that wine is a picture. It is a metaphor for his blood that was going to be shed for all of humanity. And how many know his blood could not run out? It had to be enough to cover my sin and your sin. So he says, well, you're talking about wine, but I'm thinking about my time when my blood will be shed. And that's why the conversation got confusing. And that's what's happening on the boat. The disciples are on the boat and they think they only have one loaf of bread. And Jesus, in a sense, says, no, you don't have one loaf of bread. You have two loaves of bread because you are holding a loaf of bread. But you are also looking at bread because I am the bread of life. And he says, be careful, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Yeast is a fungi. That if you mixed in the dough of bread, just a little bit of yeast has the power to contaminate the totality or affect the totality of the bread. In the Bible, yeast is a metaphor for unbelief. It's a metaphor for sin. It's actually a metaphor for pride because it is the yeast that causes the bread to rise. It causes the bread to get puffed up. Jesus says, be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees, the religious system of Herod the political system, because when you start mixing religion and politics in the purity of who Jesus is, it will contaminate the bread. Oh, yes. If, if you think that you can bring transformation through your life, through religion, your works, your good deeds, or that you can bring transformation through your political party or through getting in power, he said, you will contaminate the totality of what I've come to do because I came to bring a kingdom and I sustain that kingdom by who I am. I am the bread of life. He's talking about the purity of the bread. The disciples still missed it. They thought he thought he was talking about provision. They're like, see, we should have brought more bread. We only got one loaf. It's not enough. Jesus is like, no, I'm not talking about that bread. I'm talking about this bread. Me. He's like, but since you want to go to provision, let's go to provision. Okay. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many leftovers did you have? They said 12. He said, when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many leftovers did you have? They said seven. He said, okay, look at the mathematics of the supernatural power of the kingdom of God. That means the first time we actually fed more people with less amount of bread and we had more leftovers. Oh, that means you got one loaf and me and 12 of y'all, I think you're going to be okay. You know why? Because I'm on your boat and if I'm on the boat, you will have every single thing that you need. Oh, but the disciples were so quick to forget all that Jesus had done. Now, this is where I want to parenthetically pause and file a complaint. I want to file a complaint, uh, not with the CDC. I, I want to file a complaint with the SSC, the Sunday School Committee, okay? Because I was raised in church, okay? Raised in church. And I'm talking about old school church. I'm talking about church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm talking about vacation, Bible school, old school church. I'm talking about, we didn't even celebrate Halloween. We had what you call hallelujah night. Yes. We had to dress up as a Bible character. You know how embarrassing it is to walk into party city and ask him, do they have an Ezekiel outfit? <laughs> I grew up in old school church and in all my years in church, I don't ever remember anybody saying to me, you know, that miracle where Jesus multiplied the fish and the bread. He did that miracle not once, but twice. 
That miracle happened twice. Do you know how many extra goldfish and graham crackers a brother could have got if I would have known he did that miracle twice? Jesus fed the 5,000, and then a few months later, he turned around and did the miracle again and fed the 4,000. And so many people focus on the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, some scholars suggest that Mark had a mental lapse and is actually talking about the same miracle twice. But Jesus refutes that in Mark chapter 8 because he reminds them distinctly that I fed the 5,000 and then I fed the 4,000. He did that miracle twice. And I want to pause Church of Chapel Hill and not just thank God for the feeding of the 5,000. I want to thank him for the feeding of the 4,000. Because the feeding of the 4,000 says to me that is, if God has ever come through in your life once, that if God has ever opened up a door for you once, that if God has ever made a way for you once, how many of you know he has the power to do it again? That if he has done it before, you serve a God that can do it again. If he healed you before, he can heal you again. If you made a way before, he will make a way again. Oh, I'm getting excited off my own sermon. Come on, do not allow the difficulty of this season or your situation to make you doubt the power of your God. If he brought you through that, he will bring you through this. It is your past history with God that ought to give you the confidence for your present. Some of you, every once in a while, you need to just start reviewing your history with God. Yeah, I dare you to cut off the TV. Stop watching Fox and CNN and ABC and NBC and HIJK Elemental P and just start rehearsing the Word of God and reminding yourself all the doors He's opened, all the miracles and the ways He's made, and that will give you confidence in the present because if He's done it before, he will do it again. I love the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000, not only because of its power, but because of its prevalence. It is in every single gospel. Outside of the resurrection, this is the only miracle that is mentioned in all four gospels. That means Jesus wanted us to remember this miracle. Not only that, the prevalence of this miracle being in all four gospels is a message to us that Jesus is not just concerned with the condition of my soul, he's also concerned about my circumstance, that Jesus actually cares about your need. You need to hear that today, that Jesus cares about the spiritual, but he also cares about the physical. That yes, he's concerned about your soul and you going to heaven and eternity, but he's also concerned about groceries. Come on, he's concerned about you paying your bills. He is concerned if it matters to you, Please know that it matters to God. Actually, scratch that. If it matters to you, it matters more to God because he's not just concerned with your circumstance. He cares about your soul. This is actually the greatness of the miracles of God because his miracles don't just reveal his greatness. His miracles reveal his goodness, that he is good. Look at Jesus who's preaching to thousands of people. He had the oratorical ability to captivate thousands of people. So much so that in the feeding of the 5,000, they didn't eat for a whole day just listening to Jesus preach. In the feeding of the 4,000, they didn't eat for three days listening to Jesus preach. Ooh, come on, so you think you can preach? Come on, you can't preach unless people will listen to you for three days and not even think about eating. That's how good Jesus could preach. But yet, even as he's captivating the audience and ministering to their spirit and their soul, He realized, wait a minute, they're hungry. I got to feed them. That means Jesus is concerned. Not only is that a message of his concern, it is also a mandate for the church that we cannot just be concerned with the condition of people's souls if we are not actually meeting their needs. Thank God you're a part of a church, Church of Chapel Hill, that actually has boots on the ground and is not just going to preach the gospel, but you are meeting the needs of the community around you because it's both. I love this because Jesus has always been looking for people to participate in the miracle with him. Now, I hope you're not bored. Don't you log off yet if you're watching right now. I see you, right? Some of y'all still in your bathrobe, okay? All right, watch this. I want to do something. I want to look at the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000, and I want to put them side by side. And I want to see what it is that we cannot forget to remember. I want to do like those pictures. Maybe you've seen it in a magazine where it's like the same picture and you have to circle the differences. That's what I want to do with these two miracles and look at the similarities and some of the differences. The first thing I noticed is that in both miracles, you had a whole lot of people, but you also had a problem. 
had a whole lot of people understand 5,000 and 4,000. That's just the men. That's not including women and children. It is plausible that there were 20,000 people gathered there. That's a lot of people. And because you got a lot of people, ooh, you got problems. You cannot separate people from problems. They go together. Don't forget to remember that you are called to problems because you are called to people. You are called to problems because you are called to people. That is number one. Quit trying to separate problems from people that go together. And God wants to use you to be an answer to the problem. I know it's easy, especially in this polarizing, contentious, divisive age in which we live in to just isolate yourself and say, I'm sick of the drama. I'm sick of people. I'm going to be by myself. The only problem with isolating yourself is you still got a problem because you can't run away from you. Oh, yes, you got issues, too. In fact, that's what this stay at home order did for a lot of us. In the middle of it, some of us realized that we were using our careers and our busy schedules to run away from issues in our soul that we never wanted to face or confront. But when everybody had to go on time out and the whole world was shut down, we had to face ourselves and you cannot run away from you. You are called to problems because you're called to people. And that's why in this season, this age, it is imperative for you to have grace for difficult people. You know why? Because you're one of them. <laughs> you're called to problems because you're called to people. I also noticed that in both miracles, compassion is what started the miracle. The compassion of Jesus is what instigated the miracle. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus saw the crowd as sheep without a shepherd, and he was moved with compassion. In the feeding of the 4,000, the Bible says that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I have compassion on these people. He verbally said, I have compassion. It's one of the only times in the Gospels that Jesus actually says he has compassion. But in both instances, compassion initiated the miracle. Number two, don't forget to remember that compassion activates the miraculous. Compassion activates the miraculous. You want to start seeing the miraculous in your life? then start getting a heart of compassion. Ask God to give you compassion and watch the miraculous begin to manifest in your life. Compassion activates the miraculous. Compassion. And that's difficult because so many of us, because there's so much going on, we have gotten in compassion fatigue to the point we just want to say, hey, there's so much going on. What can I do? I just, I just, I won't do anything. No, you don't have that luxury if you are a follower of Jesus. How many of you know we must do something? If you have God's heart, you have to do your part. You can't do everything, but you must do something because God will not allow you to be apathetic if you are his disciple. You must do what you can because compassion, hear me, is when care and action collide. Compassion. I love it. The feeding of the 4,000, we get insight to how compassion works because Jesus says, I can't send them away hungry. He says, some of them will faint along the way because they've come from afar off. They come from afar off. Look at the compassion of Jesus that in a multiplicity of thousands of people, he actually knew with specificity how far some of them had come from. That means Jesus knew their address. That means that you cannot have compassion on other people unless you get clarity about where they've come from, unless you have concern or clarity about their journey, where they've come from. Come on, am I the only one? You ever been in a situation maybe where somebody's uh, talking to you and they're just like going off on you and they forgot as they're talking to you that you haven't always been saved? Come on, you know some words that are not in the King James Bible. You ever have one of those moments where you're like, oh, okay, I'm about to let them know what I really think. You do know I can raise more than a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies and you're wanting to go off on them and your heart's palpitating and sweat's coming off of your forehead. But don't you just wish in that moment before you react out of anger that a pause button could be pushed and all of a sudden you could just get clarity on where that person came from, how they were brought up, what they had been through, maybe even just what they went through that day. And how many know your response would change because you got clarity on where they came from. And that clarity caused compassion to rise up. Compassion activates the miraculous. Another thing I noticed that in both miracles, the magnitude of the crowd, the demand of the crowd, again, this is 20,000 plus people, 
It made the disciples ask the wrong questions. You ever notice this? In both miracles, the disciples asked the wrong questions. The feeding of the 4,000, the disciples looked at the crowd and they did the math. They said, it would take a half a year's wages to feed as many people. They go, Jesus, are we to spend that much money on bread? Wrong question. In the feeding of the 4,000, they looked and said, well, where can we even find enough bread to feed these people in this place? Wrong question. The magnitude of the problem made them ask the wrong question. Hear me today, Church of Chapel Hill. Some of you are so worried and so stressed right now, and it's simply because you've been asking the wrong questions. Because I found out that worry is often the byproduct of asking the wrong questions. Often when I'm worried or anxious, I've been asking myself the wrong questions. Worry is often the byproduct of asking the wrong questions. Some of you don't believe me. You're like, give us some scripture for that, Robert. I'll give you scripture for it. In Matthew chapter 6, these are not my words. This is red letter. This is Jesus talking. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33, so do not worry. Don't worry. Saying, here come the questions. What shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do you see what Jesus says? He says, do not worry. And then right after that, he starts listing the questions that make you worry. What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What am I going to dress? Well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? What about my job? What about my retirement? What about the car? What about the house? What about the kids? What if I have to have them in house this entire school year? What if I have to wear a mask for the rest of my life? What if there's another shutdown? What about this? What about that? Huh, you just sneezed. What if I got it? Wrong questions. Listen, I'm not saying you shouldn't have concern. I am not saying you shouldn't walk in wisdom. I am saying do not allow the weight of a situation to make you ask the wrong questions and incessantly worrying. Sometimes you just got to say, forget the worrying and go to the right question. Don't forget to remember to always ask the right question, the right question. And this is the right question. You ready? Jesus asked it in both miracles. This is the right question. How many loaves do you have? That's what Jesus asked in both miracles. He said, how many loaves do you have? I love that question. I love that question, first of all, because Jesus asked that question. I love it also because how many loaves do you have? That question doesn't lead to worry. That question makes you work. That question makes you look and find out what has God given me? What do I still have? Yes, I've lost some things, but what do I have left? How many loaves do you have? I want somebody in your house or if you're watching and you can type it in, just type that question. How many loaves do you have? That's the question you ask in a global pandemic. How many loaves do you have? That's what you ask in a fallen economy. How many loaves do you you have? What has God given you? When you realize what you have, it makes you grateful for what you do have. But the enemy wants you to focus on what has been lost instead of what you have left. How many loaves do you have? Ooh, I feel like preaching in here today. In fact, I got, I got an illustration for some of you, you know, that you need an illustration. See, these right here, these are my loaves. This is my bread. Okay, it's my bread. Okay, from my house, I got this bread. This is my bread. Some of y'all don't like it. You don't like this brand. That's cool. This is not your bread. This is my bread. This is what I have. It might not be your favorite brand. It's not gluten free, but it's what I have. And God is not going to hold me accountable for somebody else's loaves. He's going to hold me accountable for what He's given me. How many loaves do you have? See, some of y'all don't like this because it's easier to go on Instagram and Facebook and like pictures of everybody else's loaves and say, oh, well, look what they have. I don't know. They got a raise during the pandemic and I just, oh, I lost. What is it? No, God wants to know what do you have? How many loaves do you have? What has God given you because you have something? Not only that, I think some of you don't like my illustration because I just got bread and you're like, well, there was fish too. But don't judge me. We didn't have any fish, okay? All I had was bread to bring. And I also didn't bring any fish because Jesus never asked for fish. Ooh, read it. You're at home, some of you. He never asked for fish. In both miracles, all he ever said was, how many loaves do you have? 
That means it was in the process of looking for the lows that they found out, wait a minute, we got some fish too. It was in the process of looking for what they did have that they actually found out they had something else. Because when you look for what you have, how many know when you take inventory on what you do have, God will reveal some things that you didn't even know you had. Come on, can anybody testify today at Church of Chapel Hill that in 2020, you found a prayer life you didn't know you had? You found some Bible reading you didn't know you have? Some of y'all been reading Leviticus in this season. Come on, you found some worship you didn't know you have because when you look for what you have, God will reveal what you didn't know was there. The fish was just extra, but they didn't find the fish until they looked for the loaves. And even when they found it, it still wasn't enough in their hands. Can you see the disciples looking at a magnitude of perhaps 20,000 people and then looking at what was in their hands and going, it's not enough. I think all of humanity has this gnawing of the soul that the mandate of our lives, coupled with the resources of what we have, never feels like it's enough. I don't have enough to be the parent he's called me to be. I don't have enough to be the leader he's called me to be. I don't have enough to be the business person he's called me to be. And can I tell you, you will never be enough. Let me mess up all your self-help stuff. It will never be enough if it's going to stay in your hands. It can't be enough if it's going to stay in your hands, because if it's in your hands, that means you have to control it. And if 2020 hasn't taught you anything, it should have taught you, you are not in control. The miracle happens when you get it out of your hands, you put it in God's hands. They put it in Jesus' hands. Put that child in Jesus' hands. Put your marriage in his hands. The Bible says Jesus took it, he blessed it, even though it wasn't enough. And then he broke it and gave it right back to them to feed the crowd. Now, you get excited and start shouting because you read the end of the story. You know how it ends. But the people in the Bible didn't know they were going to be in the Bible. You know that, right? So imagine being there and what's in your hand is not enough. You've got 20,000 people who are hungry. You give it to the preeminent, preexistent, all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe. And when you give it to him, he goes, ah, thank you for it, Father, and breaks it. Then just gives it right back to you to feed the multitude. You'd be like, uh, you want to bless this one more time? These people are hungry out here. Come on, how many you know the multiplication of the fish and the bread did not happen in the hands of Jesus? It couldn't have happened. That wouldn't have taken faith. If you take what's not enough and you give it to Jesus and all of a sudden it starts multiplying instantly and you'd be getting excited saying, okay, let's get this party started. No, the multiplication did not happen in Jesus' hands. That wouldn't have taken faith. He just blesses it, breaks it, and gives it right back to them. And it still wasn't enough. But even though it wasn't enough, at least it's blessed now. Ooh, it's still a little bit, but it's got God's blessing on it. I'm telling you, I will testify. I would rather have a little bit with God's blessing than have a whole lot without his blessing. It was blessed. And as they passed it out, it multiplied. Now think about this. This miracle is not efficient. Come on, 20,000 people and only 12 guys are passing out the bread. How long is this miracle taken? Come on, Jesus, you have all power. You could have just wiggled your nose or snapped your fingers and just made everybody be full. He could have set up an in and out fish and bread station and just kind of got everybody through and herded them through like cattle and kind of got this going expeditiously. Why are 12 guys passing out the bread to 20,000 people? Jesus says, I wanted to take that long because I want you to understand. Don't forget to remember that multiplication happens through interaction. I want you to see the faces of the people that you're passing the bread to. I want you to perhaps get their story and know what they've come through. I want you to see the little boy eating the bread with his dad. I want you to take your time because multiplication happens through interaction. See, this is why the enemy wants the church divided. This is why he wants your family divided because a house divided cannot stand. But multiplication happens through interaction. And as they interacted, the bread multiplied. And even when they got down to the last bit, it was always enough to the point they had leftovers. Feeding them the 5,000, 12 baskets left over. Now here's my problem, and I land here at Church of Chapel Hill. I give the disciples a pass on the feeding of the 5,000. 
Up until this point, we had no context that Jesus knows how to multiply fish and bread. So I get why you're nervous. I get why you're stressed. I do not, however, give you a pass on the feeding of the 4,000. When you saw the feeding of the 4,000, you saw the magnitude of the crowd, you already at this point have the history of what God is able to do. You should have looked at the feeding of the 4,000 and gone, oh, we've been here before, got the t-shirt. Come on, y'all get the fish and the bread. Let's use the same system we used last time. You should have been ready. How did you already forget God's power? Well, maybe we ought to look at ourselves as disciples because how many times do we forget that God's been faithful before? He will be faithful now. But I also think it's deeper than that, because I noticed in the feeding of the 5,000, the big issue for the disciples was the price. They did the math. They said it would take a half year's wages to feed these many people. Are we to spend that much on bread? The issue was the price. But in the feeding of the 4,000, the issue wasn't really the price. It was the place and the people, because they said, well, where can we even find enough bread to feed these people? In this place, the issue was the place and the people, which made me go, where was that place? And who were those people? What made the 4,000 different than the 5,000? Well, this is where you got to read your Bible and not just read your Bible, maybe even go to the maps in the back. Because the feeding of the 5,000 happened in Bethsaida, in, near the Sea of Galilee, in Jewish territory. But the feeding of the 4,000 happened in the region of the Decapolis, in Gentile territory on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. In other words, the feeding of the 4,000 happened in a place that the disciples always avoided with the people that they thought they were better than and they did their best to stay away from. That's where the feeding of the 4,000 happened. No wonder they had an issue with the place and the people. They had spent their whole life avoiding it. The feeding of the 4,000 was a field trip to show the disciples that if you are going to be a person that passes out the bread, which by the way, I am the bread of life, you don't get to pick who you're going to pass the bread of life to because everybody needs the bread of life. If you're going to be my witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, you don't get to pick who you're going to pass the bread of life to because everybody needs the bread. Come on, somebody. Old people need the bread. Young people need the bread. Pentecostals need the bread. And charismatics need the bread. And those who are Methodists need the bread. Every color, every race, every creed, every generation needs the bread of life who is Jesus. And if he's going to use you to pass it out, you don't get to pick who you're going to give it to. The feeding of the 4,000 was a field trip to break the disciples' mentality and ideology of who they thought was worthy to get the bread. And I love it because what Jesus did with the bread is what he did with the disciples and what he'll do with you. Because he took it, he blessed it, then he broke it so it could be multiplied and feed more people. And what Jesus did with the bread he was doing with the disciples, he took them, he blessed them, but he had to break some mindsets and some things in them so that they could be used more. And Jesus will do the same with you. Some of you right now, this year is a breaking season, but can I tell you the breaking is not to destroy you. It's so God can use you more to feed more people. When you get through this year and this season, you're gonna be able to help more people because of the breaking. Can I be honest, Chapel Hill? This has been a breaking year for me. Been a breaking year for our ministry. Everything was shut down. Our ministry lost 40%, if not more, of our revenue. Everything stopped up until this year. I didn't have a point of reference for going through depression or having an anxiety attack. This has been a breaking year for me. But can I declare that whenever you're going through a breaking, that's when you cannot forget to remember. I took a field trip, just like the disciples took a field trip forced by Jesus to the other side of the lake. I took a field trip to Pittsburgh, Texas. There's a picture of me standing. You see it in front of a church. That church I'm standing in front of in Pittsburgh, Texas is the church my grandfather started in Pittsburgh, Texas, that great metropolis 
metropolis because I remembered stories of my mom telling me how my grandfather built that church and how he never had more than 50 people, but God's presence showed up every Sunday. I remember the stories of my grandmother laying her hands and praying for me at three years old, saying, God's going to use you to preach the gospel around the world. I remembered those stories. So in the season of depression, in the season of wanting to give up, seeing racial injustice and innocent black people killed, and the season of not even wanting to preach, I I took a field trip and I went to the church my grandfather started and I sat on the pew of that church and when I tell you God met me in that church and I reminded myself that the same God that brought my grandparents through is the same God that will bring me through that the same God that was faithful to them is the same God that will be faithful to me don't forget to remember I had to remind myself that even though my grandparents never pastored more than 50 people how many of you know God is still moving through them because they prayed prayers that never expired and the things they didn't even get to see in their lifetime is being accomplished through their bloodline. Come on Church of Chapel Hill, you don't know who Fannie Mae Tudman is, my grandmother. You don't know who Harold Tudman is, but every time you hear Robert Madu preach you are hearing my grandparents preach because of their faithfulness and that's why you can't quit or give up in this season. If God brought you through that, he will bring you through this he is faithful. Don't forget to remember the faithfulness of your God. I want to pray for some of you who are going through the breaking season and remind you the breaking is not to destroy you. It's so God can use you more. So you can comfort people with the comfort that you have been comforted with. Can I pray for you if you've been going through the breaking season? Would you bow your heads? Father, I pray for my brother. I pray for my sister. That this year they feel like the breaking is killing them. God, I thank you that the breaking is not to destroy them, it's to make them stronger, to make them better. God, we can handle the breaking if we are in your hands. Father, thank you that we had a purpose before we ever had this pandemic, and that purpose will be accomplished. God, we trust you in the blessing and we trust you in the breaking. Just right where you are, I also wanna give somebody an opportunity today to surrender your life to Jesus. How many of you know he is that bread? And maybe you've been going to other things to satisfy, to fulfill you, to bring you sustenance, and you're learning in this season that those things never fill the void. But can I tell you, friend, Jesus is the bread of life. His body was broken on a cross for you. And as you feed on him, you'll find that he has every single thing that you need. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity to pray this prayer right now in this moment, wherever you're watching this from. God's parent presence knows no limits, no bounds. Pray this prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, I confess I cannot do life without you. I need you. Thank you for dying on a cross and getting up from the grave for me. I believe you are the Son of God. You died for me, but you're also coming back for me. But until that moment, I will serve you all the days of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Make me brand new. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, Church of Chapel Hill. Hey, I cannot wait uh, for the next time I'm actually able to be with you in person. It's going to be phenomenal. Love you so much, Pastor Dave and Cindy Devine. And until I'm actually able to see you again, may the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, and give you grace and peace now and forevermore. God bless you.